Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Since the vast majority of our listeners hear this show in archive and not during the live airings on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. U.S. Central, I wanted to start this show with a quick disclaimer and an apology. At the time we started the show with Matt Dillahunty, uh, we had some audio problems that resulted in some not great audio fidelity and some occasional distortion. And for that, you have my apology. Unfortunately, we did not have the time to stop everything at the moment and find the source of the problem and get it fixed. The good part is, is that Matt Dillahunty was just such a good guest and we had such a good 90-minute conversation that I think it sort of transcends the technical challenges we had. So again, accept my apologies and I hope you can get past the glitches to enjoy what was a great show with Matt Dillahunty, host of The Atheist Experience. Thank you so much for joining us. This first hour of the Thinking Atheist Radio Podcast is brought to you by our very first sponsor, the folks at EvolveFish.com. Gary and the folks out there have been a tremendous supporter of TTA on our YouTube page, and I'm proud to have him here on the show. My special guest, you probably know him as host of The Atheist Experience, and more importantly to me, he's a good friend. Matt, I'm glad to have you on the show, my friend. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm glad to finally be able to get our schedules coordinated for this. I know you're always in motion. <laughs> I know that you're yeah. juggling the full-time job. And Now, are you still the president over at the Atheist Community Boston? or I am until the elections uh, in May, I think, is when we're having elections, and I'm not running again. You're done. I mean, not that you're done with the organization, but there simply aren't enough hours in the day, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's, you know, the the ACA is structured so that the president is kind of an outward facing position, the vice president's inward facing. And so Jen Peoples does most of the actual work. But, you know, I've, I've been president for six or seven years or so, and, and we've managed to accomplish quite a bit. But I have a lot on my plate. I don't know that I'm actually doing the ACA any good as president. I have no intention of uh, leaving the show or ceasing any of those efforts and I'll still be involved, but I, I want to step out of the way so that it doesn't just be, I don't want it to be the, the Matt show. There are other people with other ideas who can come in and, and lead the ACA to bigger and better things, I hope. Well, talk to me about some of the other people that help you. When people talk about the atheist experience, in some ways you've kind of become the franchise player. At least you're one of the names that people know and recognize, but there are also many others who are a vital part of that show who are doing just as much, if not more, than you are. Do you want to give them some props real quick here on the show? Absolutely. It used to be just me and four or five co-hosts, and it got to be a little difficult. People just weren't getting enough time. So one of the things, and I wasn't getting enough time off. So Russell Glasser, who has been doing the show longer than I have, fills in as a host. So I do three weeks and he does a week, um, but there's a lot of shuffling of schedules. But there are also several co-hosts who are just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, Tracy Harris is one of my favorite people, and she has this way of thinking that really has the ability to drive home points and make great analogies and, and kind of cut to the chase. Jen Peoples, who's the vice president of the ACA uh, and fills in for me quite often when I'm when I'm out. Um, it, it, she's been great. Everybody's been great. I mean, I could I could talk everybody up. Martin Wagner, Jeff D, who's been doing this probably longer than I've been an atheist since the show was on while I was still uh, a Christian. And Martin used to host it then, too. And um, Don Baker. And I'm forgetting somebody, I'm sure. Martin, Jeff, Don, Tracy, Jen, yeah, that's, that's the main five. But the behind-the-scenes people whose names come up at the, at, at the end of each show in the credits, um, Frank and John and Shelley, those are the producers who work with, you know, they went and got certified to the public access studio to be able to produce a live TV show. Um, they're there about an hour or so before every show to set up the table and the blue screen and the lights and the audio and do a practice call and get all the CG graphics stuff ready to go. I know you've given your story. I'm, I don't 
I don't need the full Monty here, but I do want to do due diligence and talk about your early years, your desire at one point to be, oh, at a Southern Baptist minister and your journey mm-hmm. out. Can you give me the Reader's Digest version for those who might just now be uh, introduced to you? Sure. Uh, the shortest version is I walked down the aisle at a Southern Baptist church at around the age of five or so to accept Jesus into my heart during a revival. Um, my folks, my parents, and almost everybody else in my family were also Baptists. There was a handful of, of people on one side of the family that were Catholic, and some of them later converted. Um, and I spent my entire life raised around that. It was just something you everybody was and everybody did and everybody believed. In my teenage years, when I actually got more interested in the church, all my friends were in the church, um, I started to realize that I couldn't have possibly understood all this stuff at the age of five. So maybe I wasn't really saved and I better do it again, um, or at least rededicate my life to Christ. And I was active uh, in the church group, in the ministry as a kid, it was in, in through my teen years. And I never had a bad experience. I, you know, I wasn't abused or molested. I didn't lose any uh, loved ones that caused me to, you know, uh, you know, doubt or question God. It, this is just the way things were. And I left and was in the Navy for eight years after high school and got to explore the world and got to meet some people. And, you know, you, you learn a little bit more about interacting with people whose beliefs aren't like yours. But I, I have to say that even throughout that time, I don't, don't really coming across don't remember coming across anybody who was explicitly an atheist. Certainly there were people who, oh, I don't go in for that God stuff. And that was just the end of it. And during that time, I wasn't very religious. I mean, I still believed in God. I still had all the same beliefs, but it wasn't an important part of my life. My life was, you know, the Navy and potentially as a career. When I left the Navy, I I got out and moved to Texas. Uh, A friend of mine hooked me up uh, with a job at Dell Computer. And so for the next few years, I was focused on my career um, and working in the tech industry and making money and having a good time. And, and God just wasn't that important. And when I lost my job in the tech industry, I, I did not want to stay in that field. And in my teen years, I was convinced that God had wanted me to be a minister, but I was terrified of public speaking. Um, and I was, you know, in love, wanted to get married, you know, wanted to make money and do all those things. And so when I left uh, Dell, I said, you know, hey, God, if, if you want me to be a minister, if that, if that was real, then I'm willing to do it. And I spent about 18 months or so uh, in really kind of serious study and prayer and, and in talks with uh, ministers and, and relatives who were, you know, spiritually wise. And my roommate at the time was an atheist, and we were our best friends. We're still best friends. And we had just agreed not to discuss this. You know, hey, I believe you don't. No big deal. Let's not let that ruin our friendship. And when I set out to actually get serious and be the best representative of Christ that I could be, it was pretty easy for me to say, I have to break this agreement because I don't want to go to heaven and have my best friend, who I love like a brother, in hell. So I set out to specifically find... um, the arguments that I would need to use to convince my atheist roommate, um, who was not, he's not very well versed in any of this stuff. He just knew, you know, Hey, I'm an atheist. Um, but I needed to convince him and, uh, that's backfired spectacularly. And then I got involved with the ACA. You guys in Texas are going through, it just seems like just like Oklahoma, there's one after another, some piece of legislation that's, someone is attempting to sort of move through that promotes intelligent design or teaching the controversy or teaching the alternative. You know, I'll talk to Arn about some of the stuff he's been going through down there in Dallas and here in the state of Oklahoma recently, the most recent ones, uh, Senate bill 758 and house bill uh, 1674, you know, they, they word it very carefully, very cleverly. It's always something along the lines of these are very complex issues. Let's discuss and we yeah. should we should treat all of the arguments equally. Are you guys still going through some of that down there in the state of Texas? Yeah, it's it's uh, they they word it carefully because they have to because they've lost so many. You know, every time they go to bat for this in court, they end up losing. And when they reach just a little too far, um, the public gets interested, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you've got big changes on the state board of education. Um, if they the, the more clever they get about it, the easier it is for them to kind of weasel 
their way in on this because, oh, yeah, what they're saying really isn't that objectionable. They're not trying to really teach that the world's 6,000 years old. Um, we, Texas, first of all, the legislature is only in session every two years, every 18 months or so. And, but the State Board of Education is, is constantly doing stuff. But, but they review standards for different uh, courses at different times. And so we did science a year or two ago. And then, you know, then was health standards. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I honestly don't know what they're actually working on now, but I do stay focused on the Texas Freedom Network, which is, uh, I, you know, I don't have the bandwidth and the ACA doesn't have it as a mission to be a watchdog for the State Board of Education, but the Texas, Texas Freedom Network does. And they're amazing. I read their, their blog and I try to, to keep up on what's going on and, and go down and, uh, you know, uh, testify at school board hearings or, or uh, lobby our representatives. It's not as bad it's, it's as it has been in the past, but we're a long way from having it solved because Texas is, a, is a, the state that kind of dictates what other states are going to use for, for public school curriculum. I uh, hear a lot about your governor in the headlines, not as much lately, but certainly during the height of the presidential primaries, and it was just one punchline after another. What goes on in your mind when you see your home state governor and all of the insanity that seems to surround him? Well, it's, you know, I, we had a call this week on the show, you know, somebody tried to suggest that wouldn't I be happier if I was living somewhere up in the Northeast instead of in the middle of Redneckville? And of course, no, because uh, Austin isn't really Texas, despite the fact that our governor's here. Uh, I, I think Rick Perry will probably be governor for just about as long as he wants, because there's enough wrong with Texas to keep seeing him get elected. Uh, he, a couple, several years ago, probably four or five years ago, when his book about the Boy Scouts came out, and he had made a number of statements um, that were not just like pro-Christian, which he's want to do, but anti-atheist, anti-secularism. And during, uh, I was down at the state capitol for the National Day of Reason, and he was walking up to the capitol building with all of his guards, and I had already called him out on the show. And so I followed him and kept asking, you know, kept asking him, you know, Governor, don't you represent atheists too? Aren't, aren't you supposed to be here to represent all of us? Why do you keep making statements that are in direct opposition uh, and, and alienating an entire section of the population? You know, do you, and he, you know, just wouldn't look at me, kept walking. And finally, one of the security guards just kind of turned around and glared at me and, until I walked away. Um, you know, I, I don't expect the governor to engage with, I, I, I was some random guy to him who came up on the street. Um, but we, you know, we tried to get him to call into the show and it's frustrating, but I also think that, uh, running for president probably in, in the eyes of everybody outside of Texas, it probably did him some political harm because I mean, he looked, I mean, he didn't even know how many Supreme court justices there were. I mean, he just looked like an idiot, but I don't think it's actually going to impact him. I think if he, if he runs for reelection, he, he's probably going to get reelected and fairly easily. And it's, it's scary. So you chase down the governor of Texas. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, uh, just have a visual in my mind of uh, Secret Service going, whoa, 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 hey, hang on. Or is it Secret Service that handles the governor? I don't know. Uh, I want to address the issue of whether or not it's you Texas are Rangers. A, a lightning rod. And this is uh, something that I, I sort of grabbed from a recent speech of yours regarding whether or not you are a firebrand. I don't think it's unfair. I've called myself an evangelical atheist. Um, I'm fine with firebrand. I mean, it's a person who kindles strife or encourages unrest and troublemaker. I'm that. I am an enemy of religion. No, make no bones about it. I'm not necessarily an enemy of every religious person. I actually would argue that I'm a friend to the religious people. You want to qualify that for me? You are a friend to the religious? Well, sure, because I think you know one of the duties uh, that a, a, a true friend would have would be to point out, where do you think your friend has erred? Um, I absolutely despise, by and large, religion and what it does to people. I, you know, I've seen it firsthand, and my inbox is full of people who are suffering because of it. I've seen people who have been atheists for 40 or 50 years who are still suffering uh, f from some aspects of religion. Uh, I personally you know, don't have that much suffering in my life because of it, but the, I, I'm convinced that their claims are 
not not necessarily that, that they're absolutely false, that I have confirmation that they're false, but they're not true. They haven't demonstrated that they're true. They haven't met their burden of proof, that it is irrational for people to accept these things. I've, I've said before, and, and I'm hoping to have a conversation uh, with some people about it at some point, that I'm an atheist because I'm a skeptic, and I think the proper application of skepticism necessarily leads to atheism. It, it, it does not support the theistic proposition. I think the best, you know, being a friend to people involves sometimes tough love. Now, that said, I don't really know how much of a firebrand I am. I don't know that I am. I try to make sure that I'm addressing arguments and not people. Um, you know, and I've tried to point out that on the on the occasions where I've said, you know, you, you're an idiot. What I really mean is you're being idiotic or and we're all guilt, guilty of that. I'm an idiot from time to time as well, maybe more often than than the people I'm talking to. But telling people honestly and trying to educate them about how to use critical thinking and evaluate claims um, is the type of thing that I think a friend would do. Talking here with Matt Dillahunty, one of the hosts of The Atheist Experience. When somebody calls your show to defend the theist position, how interested are they really in dialogue? I mean, haven't they circled the wagons? Aren't they totally on the offense, not listening? Are you wasting your time? It's, it depends. It, it varies from person to person. I do not think by any stretch of the matter of fact, I'm, con, I'm absolutely positive that I'm not wasting my time because I have emails from people who used to be theists and are no longer theists because of the show at every single uh, speaking event, whether it's the Secular Student Alliance event or a debate or whatever else. There has been at least one person who's come up and said, I'm an atheist because of what you guys do on the show. I used to be this. I used to be this. My story is like yours. So it's not when I'm having a debate or a discussion with the caller, it's not necessarily about the caller. It's about the other people that are listening. Okay. But I have heard from people, at least one, if not two, who were repeat callers to the show several years ago um, and are now atheists. But they don't want to acknowledge, you know, they don't want to call back in and say, I called and said such and such, and here's why I was wrong. They're still kind of coming to grips with this. But it, I've, I've heard about, heard it in email. Um, I've heard it from people in person. There's no way that this is a waste of time. With any individual caller, it may be. And we, we have prank callers who honestly don't even believe what they're saying. And my, my take on the prank callers has always been, as long as it's something that somebody believes. I mean, I can't tell whether or not they're sincere most of the time. There are some times when you can spot the obvious prank caller. But it, if they're presenting an idea that somebody believes, and we can have a conversation about it that it provides education to people, that's good enough. You know, I obviously don't want the prank calls that, you know, uh, you're fat or you're dumb or blah, blah, blah. Uh, those are a waste of time. There, there are callers who have circled the wagon. They are just calling in to preach. And those are the ones I, I try to make sure people get as good as they give on the show. And that's why I can have a 45 minute debate with Matt Slick or a really long conversation with somebody else, as long as there's a dialogue going on. But as soon as somebody starts arguing dishonestly, if they refuse to acknowledge points, if they just hop from one thing to the other, and it's clear that all they're trying to do is a shotgun approach of getting their ideas on TV, there's enough religious programming on TV that I don't have to sacrifice our show to encourage that. It's funny, I had a message in from someone, seems like it was the first part of last year, which was something along those lines. You're wrong, you're deceived, you're missing the point, you're deceiving others. And then I got a message back just a few weeks ago that said, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I blew it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I actually, I've come to the point where I sort of have lined up with you, which is weird. I mean, it's a very rare thing. Normally people are sending, they're not receiving, but there's no feeling like having a correspondence from someone who actually said, you know... You sort of made sense. It's a tremendously gratifying feeling. It must be for you as well. Yeah, and if you think about it, you know, I'm living, breathing, walking, talking proof that arguing with believers is not futile. And my, my friend, Keith Will Jensen, who uh, is absolutely hilariously funny, uh, and, and I can't wait to see him again at the American Atheist Convention and stuff like that, he, he has this bit that he did where, you know, when he's with atheist groups, he kind of breaks from his comedy a routine for a moment and says, look, how many people out here in the audience were, were used to be believers? Please, you know, raise your hand. And, and the hands are up all over the place. And he says, I think we were worth talking to. I think we were worth engaging with. And he's absolutely right. Everybody is worth that. If I put you on the spot and said, if there was one repeat theist argument that makes you want to just 
get in your car and drive into a retaining wall <laughs> because if you you know because you've heard it so many times. I mean, what is it? Is it the how are you moral without God? Is it Hitler? I mean, what are some of the ones that just really cook your noodle whenever you hear them? Well, there was a period of time where we just flatly declared moratorium on Pascal's wager because it's I mean, it's wrong at every conceivable level. It's it's the most useless um, kind of safe bet thing. Well, you might as well do it because, you know, you could get rewarded. I mean, it's just dumb. Um, but I, you know, having done the show, I don't know, I don't know how many hundreds of episodes over the last seven or eight years, we've heard arguments over and over again. And I, I strive to try to find new ways to address them because I have to understand that some people are listening for the first time and the people who are listening for the 10th or 15th or hundredth time might benefit from a slightly different way of addressing it. And so, of course, people will write in to say, oh, you completely dropped the ball on, you know, this episode on that. And maybe I did. But, you know, I want to I want to try and address these things as many ways as possible. Um, I the transcendental argument for the existence of God is annoying because it's one of those things that there's a small subset of people who actually really do properly understand what they're talking about in that argument. The transcendental argument, by the way, is, is, is the cornerstone of presuppositional apologetics. And it's, it's basically the three foundational laws of logical thought, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, have to have some author, and that author is God. And it, it, it's wrong all over the place. But I've taken to kind of addressing it differently lately, because what they're basically admitting when you go to it and you say, give me your absolute best knockdown argument for God, and they go to tag, um, what they're saying is they believe that we exist in a universe where we were created by a God who gave us a brain, plopped us down, and allowed us to use that brain and logic and reasoning to discover all that we can about the universe. But the single most important question that anybody could, could possibly discover the truth on if it's true, is something that can only be properly comprehended by a very, very small, educated, thoughtful portion of the population. And yet, when I walk into Baptist churches, the people down there don't believe. I'm convinced that nobody has ever come to a belief in Christianity because of the transcendental argument for God. This is a prime example of starting with a conclusion and making every attempt to structure an argument that leads to it, and it's flawed at just every corner. Is it an excuse for, say, the apologist to take the position of moral superiority? It's not a convincing argument to the general population. Is it just a way for the elite to sort of position themselves? I, I'm convinced it's a way for apologists to convince themselves that they're smarter than they are. Um, you know, you mentioned the moral argument earlier. I, I've kind of incidentally come, become known as the morality guy because I keep doing these debates, and even when the debates aren't supposed to be more about morality, that's always the go-to. Uh, I don't find that frustrating at all. I'm actually kind of fascinated by the topic, and I, I enjoy talking about it and thinking along those lines. But TAG is, is one that just seems to, by and large, be a waste of time. Uh, I, I enjoy it because I'm kind of a philosophy nut. I'm a little bit of a let me do the deep thinking masochist thing. But there are days where it's just, you know, shut up already. That's that's just a really dumb argument. After a while, I mean, you can only hear, do you believe in absolute morality so many times before your left eye just starts to twitch? <laughs> and you think, is there nothing new under the sun? And you've yeah. done a lot more debating. I mean, I do a lot of conversation in these shows. We do a lot of storytelling. I don't do a lot of debate. I don't know how you do it. How do you get through a show when it's the Hitler card. It's the, uh, the, uh, all of science is in conspiracy to deceive, <laughs> you know, science, yeah. the Satan has corrupted the whole of the scientific community. I mean, one argument after the other, do you ever, have you heard any fresh ones lately or are they all pretty much the same? It's kind of funny over the course of the, the time that I've done the show, I've noticed that they seem to come in trends and it depends on which apologist is the apologist du jour and what argument that they're they're currently trotting out. And so for a while, you'll hear uh, Pascal's wager, and then it'll kind of fall by the wayside, and then it's Kalam for a little while, and then you'll hear it start into the presuppositions. And you, and you work through this pathway, and then all of a sudden you can tell, okay, 
I kn- I know based on what the caller's saying exactly who they've been reading, who they've been listening to, um, and by and large, most of the callers don't even fully grasp the arguments that they're trying to make, which we see over and over again. When I try to get them to outline it, I mean, it's bad enough that they they couldn't put together a a, a valid and sound syllogism if they tried. And it, this is not this is not a slam on people for being stupid. This is a, a a kind of a an area that most people aren't really educated. I mean, we don't spend time in the public school system. We should spend more time teaching critical thinking, but we should also spend more time teaching the foundations of thought and logic. And we don't. And so people hear things, and because they reinforce what they already believe, they're convinced. And so literally, I've had people just call in and say, "Well, look at the trees." <laughs> Look at the trees. How do you explain the trees without God? Well, I don't know. Oak trees come from seeds. I, yeah. It seemed kind of simple to me. It's almost like when you become a free thinker, when you become a skeptical thinker, you take the looking glass and you just flip it 180. You find yourself looking at different ways at what you used to take for granted. You probably did a 180 completely on what? Everything from homosexuals to abortion to stem cells. Any of that take place in your life? Yeah, I, I I changed my views on a lot of things. It, you know, and before I actually hit that, this we, we're often accused of being arrogant. You know, atheists. Oh, you're so arrogant. It's actually the Christian worldview and the theistic worldview that thinks they are the special creation and everything in the whole dang universe was specifically created with them in mind. How much more arrogant can you be? Uh, you know, if anything, the recognition that I'm an insignificant. Uh, little speck on another insignificant little speck in the broader universe is is something that's very humbling. Um, but they tend to 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 try to think that well because we think we've got it figured out that makes us arrogant. And it's really not that we've got it figured out. It's that we understand that their claim to have it figured out is not true. Before I get to the switchboard and do the emails, are you opposed at all to speaking about your family, your mother and father? I've spoken about them a little bit before. I, you know, I, normally there's no subject for me that's truly off limits. But I mean, you know. Well, I know that you know for our parents, this is a very difficult thing. I think if I and correct me if I heard you incorrectly, but I, I want to say that it was in Canada when I heard you say something along the lines of, "I know there can't be a heaven because yeah. if my mother was to go to heaven, there's no way she could achieve." absolute bliss knowing that her son was being tortured forever. And I'm paraphrasing, but is that an accurate statement? Yeah, it's, it's something along those lines. It's, it's an argument that I was putting together to show that even if there is a heaven, none of us are there. Nobody's there. Um, and, and it really has to do with, with how we label ourselves and how we, uh, with identity. And my mom is this collection of memories. Um, my mom loves me. And so if I am being tortured in hell and my mom is in heaven, and there's no sadness in heaven, that's a conflict. There's no way my mom could be in heaven and be happy. Now, you could put some facsimile of my mom up there, but that's not my mom. And you find people so, are starting to equivocate now, right? Well, God wipes your memory. I've actually heard this argument. Yeah, no. which means it's not you up there. Yeah, God it, actually, he, he erases and you start again so that you can then enjoy heaven. She won't know that her son is being tortured forever. Does your mom truly feel that way? Does she worry about you in hell? Oh, my mom thinks I'm working for Satan and that I'm destined for hell. Yes, that's that's now it's it's actually better on my my mom still loves me despite this um, on my wife's uh, part of my wife's family. They don't think I'm working for Satan. They think I am Satan. Wow. So, yeah, it's yeah. And they, they really don't care. The difference, of course, is that my mom cares. Well, what about what does that do for Thanksgiving and Christmas? You you go hang out with your family. Is it the elephant in the room? Do you guys talk about it? Is are you kind of done talking about it? We're kind of done. Um, you know, early on, uh, there was there were several attempts to talk about it. Um, they were not equipped to have those conversations, and they knew they weren't equipped to have them. Um, and they just they're going to keep clinging to God. And so we kind of came up with this agreement. Um, you know, I love you. You love me. Uh, we're not going to to wreck that by talking. Kind of the same agreement that I had worked out with my roommate ages ago. Um, my mom violated that agreement one one time and sent me a a long email all about how she knows God's real and she wouldn't lie to me. And 
I ripped into it just as if she were nobody. I, I, re I replied at length to that email with no consideration to who the author was. I wanted to be as honest and straightforward as possible. And I was worried when I clicked send that this was going to end my relationship with my mother. Mm. And as it turned out, uh, she just wrote back and said, oh, you're just like me. I used to have all those same concerns, but Jesus <laughs> fixed it all. And then my dad forbid her from talking about it anymore. You just have doubts. I've had doubts in my life, Matt. You know, I've been through the yeah. valley in my life, but I just know one day Jesus will reveal himself to you. And when that day comes, we'll rejoice together. That kind of thing really rings a bell with me. I don't know if that's yeah, what she it's, said. It's worth pointing this out because this comes up a lot with other people who are dealing with uh, the loss of family and everything else. Our relationship, mine with my parents, will never return to what used to be normal. But we have settled in on a new normal, and it's the recognition that we love each other. And the one tip, that, the one thing that I think I did right, because there were a lot of things that I did wrong in this, um, but one thing I'd recommend is, and it only applies to people whose parents have beliefs similar to mine, but they, they believe God exists. They believe God wants me to know that he exists. And they believe God has a plan and answers prayer. And they also understand that I'm not going to be swayed by their emotional appeals and their personal uh, appeals to personal revelation. And so what they need to do is pray to God to reveal himself to me because they know I won't deny it if it happens. That has allowed them to take the burden off of their shoulders and put it squarely on God where it belongs. So your parents don't punish themselves for failing as parents? Not anymore. Um, there was there was a little bit of that early on um, when I saw what what Christianity did to my dad. Um, if I didn't already hate religion and Christianity, I would have definitely hated it at that point. Um, but I don't think that they're going to grieve probably until the day they they die. But they're they're choosing to leave it in God's hands and focus on maintaining a relationship as I am. I love my parents. I want to, you know, so when we're at Christmas and they pray, they, they pray. I, I just stand there. We, when Beth and I got married, my dad and, and mom put together the rehearsal dinner and um, I let them do whatever they wanted to do. And on their own, they said, look, we don't believe in drinking, so I'm not going to foot the bill for any alcohol, but they're welcome. To, your friends are welcome to drink if they want. And when we, before we have dinner, I'm going to do a prayer because, you know, it's, I'm paying for it. And I was like, pray, go ahead. I, I don't mind. And nobody, none of my friends are going to mind if you do a prayer before the rehearsal dinner. It was fine. Everybody got along. You had an opportunity to maybe create some goodwill no skin off anybody's teeth. You didn't sell out, right? And you still had R and Rock be the officiant at your wedding, which is one of the most awesome things ever. <laughs> yes, it is. It most definitely is. And it, it really, though, it's, it, it kind of it was, it was about being consistent. You know, my house, my rules. Your house, your rules. And I will. You know, when when I'm at my dad's house. I couldn't, there's nothing that could possibly make me object to them praying. And the rehearsal dinner, dinner was my dad's house. It's something that he did for us. Um, and I'm fine with him doing it any way he wants to. And if it would have sucked, then we could have done another one on our own. You know, my dad can have whatever party he wants. And it was great. Everybody had a good time. Talking here with Matt Dillahunty. If you have time, I'm going to go to the switchboard and field some calls. Absolutely. Area code 704. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Jasmine. Jasmine, I'm, I'm so glad you waited on support. us. What's going on? What do you uh, have for me and Matt? There was a story the other day my brother told me that I wanted to share with you guys. She's in middle school now, and some guys came over. Some, I guess they were from some church or something. They came over to school, even public school. And they came and talked to students about God and Jesus and stuff. They gave them all these little little Bibles to take home. And he came home and he told me this story because he knows that stories like this really piss me off. So he, he came over and he, he told me this wonderful story about people coming to school and they, they, them having this big assembly about uh, over it and stuff. It was... If you're wondering what to do, Part of it depends on whether or not attendance was required. Um, part of it depends on how they went about doing this. But the fact that they were handing out Bibles, um, yeah, that was... it would be worth it, I think, to contact uh, the Freedom for Religion Foundation, get them the details and tell them what went on, 
uh, this may actually, and it sounds like it might be, um, uh, against the law. I think it was. It was because everyone had to be there, according to what you told me. Everyone was. Everyone had to be there. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd recommend contacting the Freedom from Religion Foundation or, or possibly the ACLU. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Well, thank you, Jasmine, very much for calling. All right. Funny, I was just talking to Catherine Stewart here last week about the Good News Club and the efforts of religious organizations to try to get their fingers and their toes in the doors of public school systems. And they are by the hundreds all across the uh, the nation. And and it's legal, but it's right there on the cusp. Yeah, actually, it, Catherine's awesome. I, I met her this uh, a week or two ago at the North Texas Secular Student Convention and got to listen to her talk about uh, the Good, Good News Club. Um, so it's, it's great to hear that you had her on because that's that's the type of information that we really need to get people. And also we need to you know, make sure people know that, um, yes, it's often difficult. You know, you contact the FFRF or the ACLU and maybe you're not a parent at that school. Maybe you have you know, you're going to may have difficulty uh, gaining standing to even bring a case. But making these organizations aware of what's going on allows them to go out and find people who do qualify, who, who can have a say in this, um, and hopefully allows us to make some changes. Area code 619. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast with guest Matt Dillahunty. Who's this? Hello, this is Jason. Thanks for waiting, Jason. Hi, Jason. What do you have for us? Well, this is my first time on. Um, I would say I'm, a, I'm still in the closet about the atheist Gnosticism. For most of my life, I went to Baptist church, like liberal Baptist and stuff like that, and tried to, I went to a Baptist college for two years, and I actually went to Mexico as a missionary in Baja. I'm from San Diego, so I went to Baja for a few years, and then I came back and basically went to a non-denominational church, visited back to the Baptist, but I wanted something more, I was looking for something more, so I finally, last three years, went to the Catholic church, but I discovered, well, not only you guys, but I discovered, have you guys heard of Guy P. Harrison? Sure, yeah. Yeah, Guy's a friend of mine, and, and his book, yeah. uh, 50 Reasons, is one that we constantly recommend. I've, I've got an extra copy oh, to give away yes. as a prize later. Not today, but... I, have, no, I, I have both say thanks, books. man. I have, I have both hey, of if you want to run a contest in the last 20 minutes, feel free. Okay. Yeah, I, I have both of his books, and they really opened up my eyes, but um, basically, I'm just seeing everything with the politics, with the whole... Catholic, just reading history, what they believe, and I'm thinking, you know what? Well, that you said you were a Baptist, you've heard of evangelical. Well, there's evangelical Catholics, and it just turned me off totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like it, in my they're heart, probably a little I rare. I guess my thing is, in my mind, I know I don't believe, but in my like emotionally, I still like um, do the thing, go to church, go to mass, do the prayer, even though I don't believe necessarily. So you, you're, you're kind of in a position where you're you're mostly keeping up appearances while you're learning. Right, and, and... right. But there's too much cognitive dissonance. So what I'm wondering is what what should I do? You know, because I see the cognitive dissonance now. I don't believe, but I feel still attached to it in a way emotionally. I I've, actually I know some people who have maintained that attachment for many many years, and and it's for any number of reasons for appeasing family members, etc. Um, I'd love to tell you that. Uh, you know, it'll go away. And, but I don't know, I don't know you, so I don't know for sure that it will. Um, one of the things about coming out as an atheist that people ask about all the time, and I just keep saying, you know, do it, do it when you're ready, do it when you're convinced that you are willing to, to take on the risk of giving up the things that you're potentially going to lose. And, uh, you know, you, you're not the only atheist in church. You're, not, you're probably not even the only atheist in your church. Um, I think, and, I, I and think the priest in the pulpit. is atheist. I think yeah, the priest was, well, yeah. I really think he is. <laughs> it, 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 wouldn't surprise me. It, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me, both because of what I've seen from the clergy project and because there's a Methodist church here in Austin that has an openly atheistic minister. Uh, I'd love to have a conversation with him because I don't understand that at all. Um, but, but, but yeah, you're yeah, not alone by any uh, stretch of the imagination. So let me ask you this, though. I'm wondering what percentage, roughly, because Seth, I heard you say about there's less and less people going to church. I agree. I agree with that. But what percentage of people go to church in the USA, would you say? I mean, roughly. I don't have a stand for the, uh, for the for the number of churched, 
It's funny, we have uh, the statistics on the rise of people who do not go to church, <laughs> who are the nuns, the non-religious, who do not associate with God or any God-centered organization, and that number is rapidly rising. It's the fastest-growing, quote-unquote, religious demographic in the USA. As far as the number of people who right. have butts in pews, I don't have the first clue. I do know that uh, there is a tremendous surge in secular thinking, or at least critical thinking, right. and non-religious, starting with young people under the age of 30, which is hugely exciting. I mean, we've got the Secular Absolutely Student fine, Alliance yeah. and all these other organizations. It's pretty amazing. I've so, got a Gallup poll that says that less than 20% of Americans regularly attend church. So it's all a facade, that it's just all kind of just to show faith or something. Oh, there's lots of different reasons that people are involved. I mean, you, you yourself, you get something out of it. Maybe it's community, yeah. maybe it's not. But for me, you know, by the time that I I got free and realized, um, I the only pleasure I get out of going to church, and I go on occasion, um, not to my own church because I don't have one, right. but I visit right. other churches because I want to make sure that when I represent Christianity, that I'm representing what's actually being taught from the pulpit and not just my memory or my suspicions. And so I will occasionally go to churches and listen. Um, I get pleasure out of sitting there um, just like playing spot the fallacy, you know, right. stuff like that. Right. There's nothing about the actual church experience that I enjoy. I have. I have hymns and Bible verses and all kinds of crap that was drilled into my head when I was a little <laughs> right. kid that, that I can't get out of there, you know, right. little, little nursery rhymes and songs and stuff. I despise all of it. I wish it wasn't in my head, but right. I'm glad that it is because it gives me the perspective that I have. Thanks for the call. I got to move on, my friend. Thanks. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. All right. all right. Take it easy. That's probably a common thing, right? Is it the community thing? Is it the comfort thing? You spend your whole life. You're going to church Sunday morning. You, you love everybody. You feel like you belong. You have a life mission. Maybe you've got food. I don't know, whatever the attraction is. And then after you come to a point where you, at least you don't hold to the Abrahamic God anymore, you still think, well, there's something out there and church makes me feel good. A lot of people like to sort of live in that particular neutral zone. Yeah. Yeah, I think not only do do we have a pretty good understanding that religions, by and large, tend to prey on people's fears, but they also maintain attendance because of fears. Because coming out as an atheist in the in the United States in the culture that we live in is not a risk free thing to do. In in many cases, you may be the only non believer that you know, and you risk losing your entire social structure, your, in some cases, your job, your livelihood. This is not a trivial thing. It's not like coming out and saying, you know, I, I, I like, you know, no chocolate. I mean, it, you know, it's, there, there's a risk there. And the fear of losing what you have is strong enough to keep some people playing the game. I'm going to ask Matt Dillahunty about the Pope. <laughs> We're going to talk sure. a little bit about the uh, the Catholic Church and get to your calls. Very quickly, though, I want to say a huge thanks to Gary and the folks at EvolveFish.com, the sponsor of uh, tonight's show. By the way, if you get a chance, you got to stop by. When I was at the Reason Rally in D.C. last year, I actually saw a young lady who had this pendant, right? And it's got the Atheist Day that looks like the Atheist Day that's part of the bulb in the Thinking Atheist logo. And I just stopped. I said, wait a minute, where'd you get that? And so I stopped and took a photograph. You'll actually see it in the video. And, and EvolveFish.com has a bunch of stuff just like that, essentially products for progressives. And it's not just about religious stuff either. There's a lot of political stuff. Uh, they've got stickers that say stuff like, for comedy, go to Fox News. For news, go to the Comedy Central Network. Stickers that say, focus on your own damn family. There's another one that says, it's your hell, you burn in it. The top 10 reasons why beer is better than Jesus. And probably my favorite in the list is, I give evolution two opposable thumbs up. That's the kind of stuff. A little bit of humor, a lot of good fun. They've also got the atheist symbols and pendants and whatnot, this kind of stuff. It's a, it's a really kind of a conversation starter, right? You go out and someone says, hey, wait a minute, what are you wearing? And then you get to tell absolutely. them, well, I absolutely don't believe in a deity anywhere. Now, this is guaranteed to be a stimulating <laughs> course of conversation. And that's why some people are like, what are you doing? You're just religious by wearing this stuff. And I'm like, well, absolutely not. <laughs> 
Absolutely not. No, you're essentially, it's an outer representation of what you are representing, what you believe in. It's a great conversation starter. By the way, Gary's also got some very cool mugs, including an Adam and Eve mug with fig leaves on Adam and Eve. When you put the hot water in and the coffee, the fig leaves disappear. <laughs> He's also got a DNA glass mug. It looks like a sign speaker. Anyway, I won't waste your time with the whole litany, but if you get a chance, stop by and see the website. It's Evolve Fish, E-V-O-L-V-E, Evolve Fish. Dot com. One of his taglines is an equal opportunity offender. Many people are offended by the Catholic Church, as they should be. We've watched the dodging and the corruption and the shuffling around of priests and the money and all of the insanity. And now the Pope, who's supposed to be appointed for life, just decides he's done. Matt Dillahunty, talk to me about your opinion of the Catholic Church and the Pope. I think stepping down was probably uh, the most rational thing that Ratzinger's ever done. Um, you know, he, he shows that he does have a concern for his organization. I just wish his organization had a concern for all of the atrocities that they're involved with. Um, the Catholic Church, I've said before, is engaged in criminal actions around the globe. We're finding out more and more, not just let's cover up and shuffle around and hide pedophile priests, but uh, work camps for women who uh, were, were suspected of possibly wanting to have premarital sex, stealing babies and, and hanging uh, somebody's, uh, the, the threat of eternal damnation, like 16 year old girls who have a kid uh, out of wedlock. There were nurses and, and nuns who basically blackmailed those girls into either giving up that baby or marrying uh, the father in order to save the soul of that kid. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, it is almost like a little mafia. Yeah. It's a crime and, syndicate. I mean, for, for all practical purposes, right? They're insulated. They're beyond yeah. approach. They've got a shitload of money. And I said the other day, you know, I, when, when reporters talk about this, Please stop calling it a sex scandal. This is not a sex scandal, what the, what the Catholic Church is involved in. It's a criminal act. A sex scandal is when somebody goes out and has an affair, you know, an illicit affair on their partner. That's a sex scandal. And by the way, it's not, it's not the, um, the individual priests who are raping kids. That's not the scandal I'm talking about. And what I'm talking about is the cover-up. And the cover-up has nothing to do with sex. This is an organization protecting itself at all costs and sacrificing anybody else who gets in the way. Do you guys have any Catholics down there in Texas? We do. Around here, it's all Baptist, Pentecostal, or Assembly of God, a few Methodists, a couple of Lutherans. But, you know, there's not a whole lot in the way of Catholicism here in this town. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, you know I'd love to, I, I keep finding myself put in a position to defending people who are otherwise despicable. When it comes to, for example, the Westboro Baptist Church, um, I have to, people go after them in ways that would violate their First Amendment rights to free speech, the same rights that protect you and I and everybody else. And so I find myself put in a position of defending Westboro Baptist Church, even though they're despicable. And I find myself, you know, when conversations come up about religion uh, versus science, I mean, you know, I got to point out that the Catholic Church, they're pretty good on evolution. They're crap on all kinds of other science stuff, and they're damaging and harmful with some of the things that they come out with. And I hate being in the position, but I have to be honest. When it comes time to elect a new pope, I would hope that maybe by the, you know, we're in the 21st century now, maybe some people could look at this and say, hey, wait a minute, I thought this was God's representative. I thought he was infallible. Um, why, you know, th there's even talk about him trying to, to, to work out a deal. To, they're going to hide him in the Vatican. I don't know how true this is so that he doesn't have to face prosecution. It, this may just be conspiracy theory nonsense, but it's the type of thing that seems like it could happen. And so there's going to be a new pope. And I don't really care that much unless the new pope comes in and actually starts not just apologizing, but actually making amends for what the Catholic Church does, then my goal is to still bankrupt it. But religion makes them feel good. You know, religion gives people hope, Matt. It provides the structure for their lives. You're attacking people at their very core. And you know, the Catholic Church has done a lot of good in the world. So how Definitely. in the world would you attack it wholesale and seek its bankruptcy and destruction? How could you do such a thing? 
it's kind of about what kind of image do you actually portray? Do your deeds back up your words? And if you say that you are a good organization, if you say that you're a good person, and yet what we find out is that you are engaged in some of the most appalling behaviors. I don't know that saying you're a good person or that you're, you're part of a good organization actually does any good. I mean, the mafia crime bosses donated to lots of charities. Were they good people? I mean, you know, how much good do you have to do? I mean, well, the Catholic Church has done massive amounts of good universities. Yes, that's all great. But that doesn't excuse the bad. And, in, and in the, when, when somebody is confronted on their bad behavior, when somebody's confronted on the actions that they've taken or endorsed that are appalling, how they respond to that is the true measure of whether or not they're a good person or a good organization. And if their response is to lie and cover up and pretend like it didn't happen and hand wave about all the other good stuff they've done, they're not good. And is there anything that has been done that could not have been done without all of the religious window dressing and all of the the religious red tape. I mean, honestly, helping other human beings and feeding the hungry and providing medicine and doing those charitable efforts requires no religious umbrella covering it. Honestly, it's just a person to person, human to human experience. That's why we support a lot of secular charities. Do you do, have you worked with any charities in your endeavors with the atheist experience? Yeah, I work with, um, you know, I donate to Foundation Beyond Belief and I work with Camp Quest many times to raise money because it's, it's the type of uh, effort that I, I think it is really needed. I remember going to church camp, but you're absolutely right. It's uh, it's people that are doing this. There's, there's no religion required. The only the only part that the religion's required for is the cover up because it's designed to protect the religious institution. If you get rid of that that institution, there uh, you still have good people doing good things. Talking here with Matt Dillahunty. Now I got to come back to the Catholic Church for just a second because. I always do a little show prep. I'm always putting my ducks in a row before we actually do the podcast. And I came across this little gem, this little soundbite from one of the episodes of The Atheist Experience where the caller was defending the Catholic Church. Now, the police force exists. It's a necessary force to keep criminals away. Yet there exists corruption in the police force, and they do things far worse than the Catholic Church. And mind you, these pedophiles would have done what they did. Pause. 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 I'm going to let you finish. Pause. But we do not. We do not. I put you on hold in case you didn't hear that. Nobody can hear you but you right now. So yeah. you're paused. We do not get rid of a necessary system. You're still yelling into the phone. <laughs> yeah. But I do I'm, not want to have a shouting match. Uh, you're not having a shouting match with anybody except yourself. Your ass is on hold. That would be most appreciated. You don't understand. I, I, if you would pause for a second, I'm trying to explain to you that you're. I'm trying to explain to you that you're on hold so that I can respond to your nonsensical position here. No, 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 sir, sir, that, sir, no, 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 no. Wow, you don't know what hold means. I'm going to give you exactly one more chance to actually have a conversation here, which is a back and forth, and you're gone. So you, the minute you hear somebody going off the rails. You just go ahead and call it, right? You take control and you say, wait a minute, hang on, let's address this first point, and you're not going to be a seminar caller. It's what I do most of the time, and it's, it's because, you know, if you begin a, a conversation and you say that you can survive in outer, in outer space with no mechanical assistance and no suits, um, and that is your starting premise for your argument for the existence of God— we need to stop right there and define what it is that you mean. What is it you're really saying? And do I agree? Because if we don't, if we can't reach agreement there, and if we can't reach agreement about the logical process of how we're going to uh, address these things and discover the truth, then all the conversation is a waste of time. Area code 248. Thank you so much for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist Radio Podcast with special guest Matt Dillahunty. Who's this? Hello, this is Mark from Metro Detroit. What's going on? The thing I wanted to mention is that, first of all, the atheist experience isn't what made me an atheist. It's what made me a skeptic. I was an atheist for most of my adult life, but I was not a skeptic. I was an atheist basically because I replaced God with cosmic beings. And there was a lot of things I believed for the longest time. Like, I was actually going to call the atheist experience one time and argue for the ancient astronaut theory. I was actually going to make that argument. And as I watched the show more and more, I realized that I, even if it 
even if there is some evidence, there's not enough evidence for you to make that claim that, that ancient aliens have come here. There is some, there might be some evidence, but there's, but it's such an extraordinary claim that you would need much more evidence than what they are providing. Thanks for that. I mean, you know, as somebody who's an atheist because they're a skeptic, uh, finding out that, that the show helped somebody uh, identify as a skeptic, that means as much or more to me than finding out people have given up religious beliefs. I actually did grow up in a um, in, in a religious household, and I still have, a, and, and I'm fighting a battle now that I don't think I can fight. I don't think I have the ability to fight it, and the battle I'm fighting now is that my brother has two kids, and he's teaching them that creationism is true, absolute, and I, I want my brother's kids to grow up knowing what it, knowing what is true. The problem is, is that it, it isn't my position to tell him how to do that. And my brother has basically told me he doesn't want to talk about evolution anymore because I have basically, I have basically explained it to him, and I think he's gotten to a position where he realizes that he can't argue with me, that I know more about it than he than he understands, and uh, he also comes from the band camp of Kent Hovind, and it upsets me so much. They actually listens to that guy and doesn't understand that guy doesn't know a lick about science. <laughs> You lead me into a, a question that we addressed a little bit last week, and let me sort of co-opt part of your statement there and ask Matt something. You have a family member who is raising their kids. They're not your kids. They're your brother's kids, right? Your sister's kids, your whoever's kids. Mm -hmm. And you know they are being raised under the false teachings, right? Demonstrably false teachings of Scripture. What is your role? Do you try to intervene in some way or is it your call at all or do you opt out completely what would you do if it was somebody else's kids in your own family so i'm i'm i have that situation but mine isn't very difficult um i can talk about it both specific to mine and in general and in general uh parents get to decide how they're going to raise their kids um you you need to be very careful about how and if you involve yourself uh unless there's demonstrable harm taking place and not just filling their heads with nonsense, even though I, I agree that that's potentially harmful. Uh, you, there's very strict guidelines as to, you know, when you can and should intervene. In my case, um, my brother is a Christian. He's a fairly moderate to liberal Christian. Um, he's a smart guy. He's, we, he had no problem at all, really, as far as I'm aware. Um, with me being an atheist. We've had lots of conversations. He's listened to the show. Hell, for all I know, he's listening to this. And I, I have a nephew and a niece, um, and my brother and I got together and talked, and I said, look, how do you want to deal with this? Because this is my thinking. I don't ever want to lie to my nep nephew or niece. And so when they ask Uncle Matt why he's not going to church, I'm going to tell them, and I need to know if that's going to be a problem for you. And he's like, nope. You tell them, you know, you, you, you can be honest with them. Now, I don't ever set out to undermine anything that they learn in church or from from my brother. I'm not even sure what the, my brother's, you know, he's a, a, a he understands science. He, you know, accepts evolution. And so I don't think that they're being filled with too much nonsense. But if I was in that position, what I would do is what I recommended other people do. Encourage those kids to question things and explore and discover the world. You don't have to go after religion specifically. You can teach them about science and educate them about, you know, asking questions and critical thinking. And you can do it with puzzles and games and trips to the museum and all these things that get them curious and, and encourage them to explore the world and discover the truth and always be honest and, and say, I don't know, but let's go find out. If they've got a question, why is the sky blue and you don't know, I don't know, but let's go find out. And that is about my best take on it. Thank you very much for the call, my friend. I appreciate your patience on hold. Thank you, and you have a good day. Bye. All right. I'll throw in one other caveat, too, is I had actually had this happen with a, a non-family member, right? They've got, they've got children, and the children are like, wow, that guy's an atheist, and it, it came up, right? And I, uh, I informed the parents, look, it, you know, if, if you're – if this comes up and your kids want to ask me about it, I'm going to tell them what I think, but I will guarantee you I will not do it outside of your supervision, right? They're young enough 
as a gesture of good faith, I want to make sure that you don't ever feel that I'm trying to subvert your role as a mother and father. If it comes up, I will tell your kid, look, I'd be happy to answer your question, but I want to do it when at least one of your parents is in our company. And until they hit a certain age, that's the tack I personally am going to take. Yep. And it, it works for me. Yeah, it's it's very similar to, to what I told my brother is that if they come to me with questions outside of his presence, um, I'm going to be honest, but I'm also going to recognize um, what he may or may not want me to say. And so I will direct them back to their dad or their mom to say, here's here's what Uncle Matt said. And he told me to come ask you to get your take about it so that they know exactly what's been said. But it's never really been an issue, thankfully. Um, I, my niece and nephew are just awesome. And when we're together, we have fun. It's not like, you know, six and 11 year olds or seven and 11 year olds are going to come up with all kinds of God questions. Yeah, they're just talking about kid stuff. They just want to be young people. Yeah, come down and, you know, play video games with me or can we go outside and make a snowman? And will you show me another magic trick? Yeah, you betcha. We're talking here with special guest, Uncle Matt Dillahunty. I had a <laughs> uh, an email in from Paul. He said, being atheist in this country is tough enough, but I truly despise the under God line in our Pledge of Allegiance. Our First Amendment gives us freedom from religion, which makes this pledge unconstitutional. But it would be political suicide if any po if any politician made note of this or attempted to correct it. What can be done? Let me make a larger question. Uh, we're talking about the possibility in the next several, let's call it, couple of decades of an atheist, high-profile atheist political candidates viable, or are we kidding ourselves? Oh, I think I think it's possible. I don't know how profile, and I don't know how soon. Well, on the way to doing that, you know, it was a few years ago, the study came out with the with atheists listed as the least trusted minority, yeah. but also like within the last year, for the first time, more than half of people polled said that they would also vote for an atheist, uh, I think for president, if I'm remembering the study right. You would have to think that there are a lot of atheists already, just not public. I mean, you know, they're playing the God card like they'd play a poker hand. It's, mm -hmm. it's about poll numbers. It's about popularity contest. But under the surface, they're like, ah, it's all a bunch of crap. You know, I mean, you got to figure the law of averages says there are plenty of atheists in Congress as we speak, I would think. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I would agree. And, you know, from what we've heard, there are several who just won't say so. Um, but, you know, on the on the under God thing, uh, I don't even know that those are battles worth fighting because nobody can require you to say the pledge or to say under God. Uh, one of my favorite ones was, was a, a young kid who said uh, uh, one nation under Canada, which I thought was just absolutely <laughs> hilarious. What was that uh, t-shirt I saw once that uh, somebody was wearing and it had a, a highlight of Canada and it said, Canada, America's hat. And then I saw somebody <laughs> else with a Canadian shirt and it said, uh, the USA, Canada's ass. <laughs> so it just yeah, kind of came around. Exactly. <laughs> There's also uh, One Nation Undereducated, which I think is a little bit more poignant. But uh, it's one of those things where I carry around several dollar bills uh, with me from before 1954 because they don't have In God We Trust on them. As a matter of fact, I just got a hold of a... In 2007, when they started releasing the presidential coins, there was a fact, there was a, a mint misprint where they did not put in God we trust on the edge of the of of the one of the first runs of Washington and Adams coins, and I have one of those that I carry around now too. Uh, it's more of an error. The others uh, point to our error, our our grand error of sacrificing a perfectly wonderful national motto, uh, and then going to the pledge and inserting probably the most divisive phrase possible directly before the word indivisible. Talking here with Matt Dillahunty, you have a military background. Yeah, eight years. I'd see, uh, a, you know, obviously the atheist community, for lack of a better word, has wildly differing opinions on patriotism. What's your take? I mean, is it, uh, you know, it's blind allegiance to the state. It's just like religion. Uh, being in the military is just like religion. Did you want to speak to that? Well, I think there's certainly there's similarities. Um, military indoctrination, you know, it, it, it serves a purpose. Um, I won't kind of validate it as good or bad, but when it comes to patriotism, I, I hate the kind of jingoistic super patriotism. I will, I'm just brutally honest. Is America the best 
Well, it depends on what category you're talking about, because yeah. on quite a few of them, we're nowhere near the best. Um, but when I when I talk about my own patriotism, my own love of the United States, it's about the ideals. It's about not even what the United States is so much as what it could be and should be and was probably architected to be. And uh, I love my country enough to work to correct the mistakes that we've made, um, but I'm not beholden to the United States. If this, if this turned into a hellhole beyond repair, um, I would hate to do it because I like where I live and everything else, but I would pack up and leave. I don't owe allegiance to anybody. My elected representatives are there to work on my behalf. I don't owe them anything. They owe the electorate. There seems to be that rampant kind of lazy, hazy, love it or leave it. There's America and then there's the rest of the world mentality. It's very, very prevalent in the church and it yeah. is extremely frustrating. It's true, I think, as a general truism that Americans are spoiled, undereducated, arrogant and condescending. I mean, we are we are the world's last superpower. I mean, you go anywhere else and they've learned English. I don't speak any other language. I've got like remedial Spanish and, you know, other stuff is we we are quite often too separate from the rest of the world, and you've got religious uh, ministers and and speakers who are are striving to keep it that way. Any attempt to unite the world is portrayed as a one world order global conspiracy we're going to take over and destroy god's country uh you know, we need to get out of it I, I want to end this idea that we are god's country or that any country is god's country you know i break down the barriers i realize you're not going to convince everybody you're you're probably going to have wars and strife maybe forever but at least for quite a while um but one of the things that i i, I like about the United States is what it could be. Area code 859, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who is this? This is uh, Tristan. You're on with special guest Matt Dillahunty. What do you have for us? First off, I just want to say, hey, Matt, thanks for your service. Um, I've been in for five and a half years in the Air National Guard, so um, <clears throat> thank you for your well, time. And, uh, thanks for your service as well. You probably have done more than I did. <laughs> Actually, not really. Uh, I work for a special tactics squadron, but uh, I'll, I'll digress from that point. Um, what I was really, I guess the main point I really want to call about is that I recently started uh, an online community because I kind of wanted to get involved. One thing that I've noticed is that uh, I, I open it up to both uh, believers and non-believers to kind of uh, see if we could eliminate the the diatribe that was going on in, in between the two. And I've noticed that a bunch of pretty much, like, it, it sounds like uh, well-learned apologists have come up and just pretty much, uh, for lack of a better term, raked the page. And so I was wondering, uh, is there a good resource for atheists to go for common arguments that apologists use? Why, funny you should ask that. <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Several years ago, Russell Glasser and I got together and decided we wanted to start a counter-apologetics wiki called ironchariots.org. Um, it's... I, ha I don't have anything to do with it currently. I wrote some of the uh, articles that are, are on there, uh, my verse-by-verse -verse deconstruction of the Sermon on the Mount, um, and, and it's kind of become a, more of a static resource. There's not a lot of people working on it, but the basic arguments for the existence of God are there, and there's also rebuttals and links to other resources. Um, it's, it's named after a, a passage, uh, Judges 119, uh, that says, uh, the Lord was with Judah and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but couldn't drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And so we figured chariots of iron is clearly the one thing that can stop God's power. And so we started that wiki and it's, it's a good starting place. Um, but there's tons of others. I definitely also recommend infidels.org. The library there was critical to my, uh, escape from religion and i mean it's it's easily one of the best resources on the web that is fantastic i've got them both open up right now and i'm already looking through them 
Uh, Infidels.org has their library divided into a historical library where you'll read Ingersoll, Voltaire, and Hume, and all this other stuff, and then the modern library where you'll read things from uh, people who. Uh, they just it just boggles my mind how much my world has changed in the last ten or twelve years. I was reading. Richard Carrier's uh, remarks and Jeffrey Day Louder and some of the others there at infidels.org during my process of escaping from religion. And now, of course, you know, Richard and I are, are friends or, or at least friendly. And it's just so cool to, to, to see this community building and people come together and working uh, to help people and help the world you know, be a better, better place to the best that we can anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been out for six months and I've been looking for something to, uh, to I guess, try and get involved. Um, and my best friend and I came up with it about two weeks ago and already we've got some pretty good conversation going on there. But uh, do you all have any suggestions for, I guess, a growing, uh, I guess, an aspiring online community? Like how to create one or? Well, no, I've already got created. I've got uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, forum, website, all that kind of stuff. I've already created it, just looking to grow it more. I really don't, I couldn't tell you how to grow a group. Um, I just, you know, somebody else started the ACA, somebody else started the TV show. I came in kind of Johnny come lately and um, we've grown, but we haven't grown immensely. And I haven't been concerned personally about how big the group is, how many people are in it, um, how many people are active. I the group be what it needs to be to make sure that the people who are there and are active are doing the things that they want to do. That's how you keep volunteers uh, engaged is encouraging them to do what they want to do. We go, let the group be whatever it needs to be. There's nothing wrong with a group that is just a, let's go drink in the pub and rag on religion. And then there's other groups that, <laughs> that are much more than that, that are political, politically active. Um, but I found that it's pretty much a good idea to let the group be what the members need it to be. And if you go try to start steering it too much, um, you end up kind of dividing the group a bit. Right. I, I was wondering if there is a community that's fulfilling the same purpose that mine is, because the last thing that I want to do is to have too much of the same brand that's out there, if you will. No, I, I don't. Well, first of all, I don't know every atheist community out there. Uh, I like the sound of what you're doing. <laughs> Um, I like the idea of potentially in, engaging and, and having the sort of community where believers and non-believers can get together. That's interesting. But I wouldn't be the slightest bit concerned about whether or not you're another one of a hundred groups or a thousand groups, because at this point we need as many as we can. You know, we we're lucky in Austin to have public access TV and the ability to kind of build up this TV show and the various podcasts. But I don't want to be the only live call in atheist podcast or TV show on the planet. I'd like to continue doing it. And I'd, I'd like to strive to be, you know, uh, the best. I would love, love some, you know, competition, but if there were a thousand of those shows, how freaking awesome would that be? You know, be it, it, it makes you look, you're no longer a fringe group when there's, and, and, and there's some growing pains within the atheist and skeptic communities uh, right now that some people are looking at is, you know, oh, this is e- crazy, divisive, and oh, you're, you're just like religions or whatever else. Saying all that aside, this is what happens when your community grows to the point that there's a, a plurality of views within it. Uh, we're, we're no longer marginalized. Uh, the nuns are bigger than, you know, Jews and Muslims and others in, in the United States and growing and growing faster than any other. Uh, and that's a good thing. And so, yeah, there's going to be growing pains and fighting. But if there's a thousand shows doing what I do, um, cool, because I didn't get into this, you know, to be uh, the atheist TV host. And uh, you mind if I share what amusing anecdote with you? Knock yourself out. Okay. Well, last week, for some reason, I had the strangest dream ever. Uh, Matt, you were the chauffeur of Christopher Hitchens, who happened to be my landlord. Uh, too much linguini the- before bedtime will do that to you, pal. You know, you got you to watch that, man. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a dream I am proud to have a, in a supporting role. With. <laughs> take it easy, my friend. We'll see you later. All right. Take care. It is a difficult balance, Matt. You know, one thing about the thinking atheist community is that I, I do want to maintain a specific tempo. 
I mean, there are some things, quite honestly, that, that I just don't want. I mean, I, it, it may be appropriate in another venue, but it's not the tempo I want for the thinking atheist. It's just not. You know, we're not a debate arena. I don't. It's not a theist platform. Uh, we don't allow seminar posters to come in and try to try to convert us and whatnot. It's really a safe haven for the non-believer and, and those who are theist or deist who want to come in and have a legitimate discussion. And they rarely happen, but they do. Are they're treated with respect? And everybody else is just escorted out. We don't do drama. We don't do craziness. I mean, I think an admin is going to have to take some ownership of the tempo they want for their community and not being everybody always screams censorship, which is not what I'm after. But I think, you know, you you are you still are sort of guiding the car. You're still behind the sure. wheel to a degree. Would you agree that's healthy? Yes. No. Not only that, I'm glad you, you said it. I mean, I, I just finished just before the show an email conversation um, on this exact subject about, you know, there are people who seem to think that, and, and I don't want to get into this in detail, but figuring out what your group, what your organization, even what your YouTube channel or forum is about is entirely your decision. You're the owner, the people who, it's always going to be somebody who does, doesn't like it. There's always going to be somebody who cries censorship. Um, there's going to be people who are claiming, well, you know, if you don't allow everybody to say everything, then clearly your ideas have no merit. I mean, it's, it's just pointless nonsense because you can't be everything to everybody. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, I absolutely love the James Randi Educational Foundation and the amazing meeting. And it's great. Randy's a hero of mine. And uh, DJ, while I, uh, we're, we're friendly, I don't, I don't know him well enough to actually say we're you know, like good friends or anything, but I have no problem at all with a skeptic group saying, Hey, we're not going to actually focus on religion. Um, that's their prerogative. It's, it's, they've determined that if they're about education, it may even be the best thing that they can do. I do have a problem with, with people who are saying that skepticism, you know, shouldn't address religion or can't, but that's a, a entirely different thing. And so, you know, if the thinking atheist uh, does something one way and you want this type of conversation and you don't want these others, that's fine. That's directing your mission the way you think is most effective. It's inevitable whenever a troll is banned or someone is removed, escorted from the room after being warned or what have you, that, you know, the email comes in, you know, uh, it's censorship. This is big brother. You're no better than the room. I mean, every, of course, it's all baiting you. And the truth is, mm -hmm. is that uh, the needs of the many, outweigh the needs of the few or the one, <laughs> you know, I always go back yeah. to Trek in a, in a crisis. <laughs> well, and, and the other, the other Trek you can go back to that they're trying to cite is this, you know, who watches the watchers, yeah. um, which, you know, if you're going to govern how, if you're the ultimate arbiter of what gets said in your forum, um, how do we know we can trust you? Well, you can't, you don't know that. What you can do is watch and see what happens. You know, I, I, um, on my YouTube channel, I only pay attention to comments for about a day or so after I post a video and then it lives there and people can say whatever they want. I very rarely go back and block anybody or delete it, but it does happen on occasion. And it's because there are some things that I don't need or want on my channel. I'd like to keep the signal to noise ratio a little higher than just let's, you know, sling insults at each other. Let's call people names. And, and if somebody gets bothered by that, Sorry, I, I pref my goal is to try to at least do something small to raise the level of public debate. And the people who aren't interested in that, congratulations, you can do your own thing. I don't, I don't owe you a forum to talk on. Look, after as many shows as, as you have done and as many shows as I have done, and we both manage our pages, and neither one of us are in the shadows, if someone by now doesn't know what we're about cannot vouch for our character and what we stand for and whether or not we stand for this or that. If someone doesn't know, it just means they're not looking. That's not my fault. Yeah. yeah it, re it reminds me, this, this comes up a whole bunch of times is somebody who's watched four or five episodes of the show will write in or call in and say, why don't you guys ever talk about such and such when we've probably talked about it, you know, a dozen times. Why don't you spend more time on Scientology? Well, I did a whole show on Scientology six or seven years ago. We've touched on it once or twice. I don't feel much need to touch on Scientology because by and large, uh, Scientologists aren't a big threat to me or to the United States or to my rights. Um, there's, you know, I, I still have the same objections to their beliefs that I always have. Um, but 
well, I got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. If you have uh, just a few more minutes, I'd like to tackle one or two more quick phone calls. You good for time? Yeah, I'm fine. I figured I'd just monopolize you, you know, and get you on the hook as long as I got you here. Area code no 314. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. It's Brooke from St. Louis. Brooke, you're on with Matt Dillahunty. What do you have? Where, where in St. Louis? Where, whereabouts um, without giving your actual address? I don't, don't want you to do that. Like, like the St. Charles area. Uh, do, you do, do you know that I graduated from Francis Howell? No way! Yeah. I graduated no way! From- that's, that's right up the street. My dad's house lives in the Howell district. Yeah, you know, uh, right there, uh, Hunter's Point is the name of the subdivision. <gasps> Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's my that's my dad's subdivision. There you go. That's it's so t- crazy. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, two hundred one um, big sky drive. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I um, grew up Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I actually went from Catholic school um, from kindergarten to eighth grade, St. Paul. I don't know if you know where it is, but um, yeah. And then I was very it was very hateful to be in that school. Everyone just had like. They're very snobby, even the teachers and everything. And um, it's just when you go into the church, the Catholic church, it doesn't feel like it has any, like, emotion to it. Like, it's just a bunch of old ladies going, Hail Mary, full of grace, like 10 million times. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's what kind of drove me away from the Catholic church and everything. But I just want to touch on a couple, you know, I know you guys are running out of time. but um, And then you guys were talking about um, children and stuff and how to raise them or, and stuff like that. And I have a little sister who's nine years old. Seth, I mentioned her to you briefly. And um, she wants me to say hi. She's at cheerleading practice right now. She would say hi herself. But um, my parents are religious, but I show her you guys videos all the time. <laughs> and her and I have um, very long conversations about it. And, you know, she's too young to, like, know for sure now. But she says she doesn't believe in God and everything. And, um, yeah, so I have, like, discussions with her about like how to question things and stuff and um she really likes you guys and she wanted me to tell you guys hi well hi back (laughs) and um one other thing matt i watch like all of your um atheist experience videos on youtube and your videos like on you um your drive to work and everything and you have like given me the confidence to like in my high school and everything to say hey that doesn't make sense or yeah well as an atheist i think this and it's actually worked out really well, um, considering the area I live in. And there are, are actually a lot of people, almost every time I say, well, as an atheist, I think this, there are actually a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm an atheist too. And I'm like, no way. So um, anyone who's out there listening, even if you live in like a religious area and everything, you'd be surprised. I would, I mean, it's not best for everyone, but I would definitely, you know, you hear all these bad stories about people coming out and bad things happening, but it can turn out good. Yeah, Brooke, thank you very much for your call. Thanks so much for, for saying that. And by the way, drop me an email. Um, there's a place in downtown St. Charles, a friend of mine opened. I don't want to advertise uh, illicitly on, on Seth's show. Knock yourself out, <laughs> man. I mean, if it's... Uh, what's your email? Uh, you can just do president at atheist-community.org. But downtown St. Charles, it's uh, Ozenkowski's Old Time Soda Shop, and they do gooey butter cake and hand-drawn uh, fountain sodas and stuff. Oh. It's great. Oh, that sounds like a field trip. Oh, cool. I totally will. <laughs> and I'm not much of like an arguer and everything, although I do get into it with a couple of people. But I think just my role in atheism is just to show people that we're not, you know, bad people and everything. I think it's just to say, hey, I'm an atheist. Let everyone know. But yes. to let them know that like we can be happy, fun, caring, kind, sweet people. Yes. And that may be far more important than actually engaging in debates or even doing podcasts or TV shows, because it's much, much harder for somebody to vilify the person that they know and love. Oh, you're an atheist. That, that's not possible. You're such a good person. It, what, just having more people out and open about it and living and enjoying life is probably the biggest asset that we have. Exactly. And a bunch of people in my school have said that to me. They're like, wow, before I knew you, I thought atheists were like these horrible people and everything. And I think it's just about changing the perception of yeah, how people view atheists, how you guys are saying about um, a lot of people wouldn't vote for an atheist, you know, in Congress or whatever. And this is, can maybe be my small part to help change that. Thank you, Brooke, very much. Thanks. I'm so glad I got to talk to you. I'm a huge fan, Matt, and you, Seth. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. All right bye. Thanks. Bye. All right. How important is it for us to address the douchebag quotient? 
we all know of examples of people who are, for lack of a better way of saying it, a little bit toxic. I'm not talking about the people who are out there just being assertive. That's necessary. Sometimes anger is necessary. I'm talking about the people who are always brandishing the middle finger to everybody they meet who is religious in any way. I yeah. myself have a little bit of a hard time with that because I think ultimately it's damaging. You're, you're, you're not reaching anybody and you're putting them off and they come back to me and they say, I am an individual. No one's going to tell me how to act. How do you address some of the more... How do I say it? In your face, almost toxic type personalities in the movement. It varies. Uh, th there are some of them um, that I've actually tried to engage with. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, one of the things, you know, I talked before about how there may be some growing pains. I think, you know, Westboro Baptist Church, um, while my parents share some of their beliefs, they don't represent my mom and dad. Um, and the atrocities in the Catholic Church don't even stand as representative of the average Catholic. And I think that recognizing that there's going to be um, some bad representatives is essential. And it's just worth pointing out that just because we share a, a label that we identify with doesn't mean that we agree on all things or even anything beyond that, that one label. It's well, the potentially, you know, we, we should. Um, we're not a hive mind. And, and our community is, is special in the sense that, boy, there's no, there's no real nice way to say this. Um, there are, from my personal experience, and I love, by and large, the atheist community, the skeptic community, there seems to be a slightly higher than I would have expected percentage of people who are awkward, maybe even, I, I don't know, maybe that we're disproportionate, maybe that we're talking about a group of people who have been ostracized, who have been the outcasts, and are now starting to, you know, uh, feel their own and reach out and be more assertive and just aren't always good about it. I, but I'll be the first one to say I'm not always the best representative of atheism or skepticism, um, but I don't ever think that I'm a terrible one. And if I am, or if I find a situation where I, I have been, then I try to take some steps to correct it. And I think that, you know, dealing with the people who are bad representatives of the community as a whole is part in recognizing that the community is diverse and you're going to have some bad, I mean, there are people who are identify as skeptics who are bad skeptics and there are people who are atheists who are not the least bit rational on any number of other things. I hear from so many atheists who are in a name, pick a conspiracy theory, uh, pick a woo belief. You know, they, they, they think that they have beaten the most important question that there is and therefore they can't be fooled and they're always right and their brain is superior and that's not necessarily the case and so it's i guess it's up to each one of us individually to, to, to do our best to recognize this i don't know what we can do to help others recognize it other than to call them out on it it's an unpopular thing because then we look like we're trying to we're, we're, it's almost like they're they accuse of making the style over substance argument. Well, this is just the way he or she is, and it's actually a larger thing for me. I think, man, and we should be as attractive as we can, not in a false way, but I would yeah. rather build a bridge than burn it. Let's uh, do one last call. I've got a, um, a Skype line. Adam, you're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast with guest Matt Dillahunty. Hello, can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, um, this is my first call. I'm an atheist in Louisiana, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the school system here. Um, I go to a public school in southern Louisiana, and there's a lot of, like, religion in the class and the curriculum. Um, like, I'm in a vocal class, and one of the main things that we do is we sing nothing but religious music, and as an atheist, I find that quite offensive and I don't know what I can do to help myself about that. Well, help me out. I mean, are we talking yeah. about Handel's Messiah, something that could be considered 
like one of the classics? Is it an artistic thing, or is it um, the teachers the, proselytizing the through the music are, selections? The song titles are I Must Tell Jesus, Blessed is the One, and Ave Maria. It's a public school? Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay, so... In keeping with my recommendation from earlier, you need to contact the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Um, you need, and there are there are other students, both current and former students, that you can probably talk to that have taken uh, that have addressed these issues, so that you can decide whether or not this is an issue you want to fight. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, of course, I'm thinking of Jessica Alquist and um, and, and several others. But contacting the FFRF is probably the first thing you want to do because they're going to have a lot better information. They've dealt with this many more times um, than I have. Okay. Thank you. I I hate to to just shuffle you off, but I'm also going to be the first one to say I don't know enough about it to really give you good advice beyond contacting the people who have the good advice. Okay. So like an email to Freedom From Religion Foundation would be able to be a good starting place? Yeah. And you can, I, I think there's even a telephone number for them that you can call. Um, you can just go to the website. It's FFRF.org. Mm-hmm. And you'll be all set, all right? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Much appreciated. Matt, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you going to be in Austin, Texas for the American Atheist Convention. Yeah, because I live here. Yeah, and, that's uh, pretty nice. You can just, what, walk across the street? <laughs> be a no, <laughs> our, our house is actually probably... You know, twenty-minute drive from downtown. Um, but you're, you, well, you're, you are, of course, welcome to come over. That's all, not only is that uh, the American Atheist Convention weekend, but it's also my birthday. So, happy um, birthday! You, you will, you will, of course, have to stop by the house and uh, have a drink. I would love to. I would love to. And and I'm a big fan of. Uh, I mean, it sounds so trite, but I mean, thank you. You're the kind of person I think that we need out there. And I'm sorry it took me so long to get you here on the show, but it's been a real pleasure to have you. Well, I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to it since probably before we first met. When I came up to Oklahoma, when you outed yourself <laughs> yeah. and uh, as an and atheist, gave a, yeah, I was like, I just can't wait till you know Seth and I get to work together on something. So, uh, and and you know, if you're in Austin, as I've said before, and it's a Sunday that's not crazy. We'd love to have you come sit in on the Atheist Experience if you feel like uh, addressing some callers with rather confused uh, ideas about reality. (laughs) Matt Dillahunty, I encourage you to uh, check out the website. It's atheist-experience.com. We will look forward to seeing you in Austin, Texas at the 50-year anniversary of the American Atheist Convention, my friend. And thanks again for being a guest on the show. I hope we can have you back, and it won't be another two years before we do it, all right? Anytime, man. Thanks so much. Take it easy. Uh, so again, special thanks to our sponsor for the show, EvolveFish.com. I will see you next Tuesday night on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. I'll see you then. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.